Hi class, Dr. Jim here. In this video, we're going to be looking at the cardiovascular system. So we're going to take our time and kind of look at the different parts of the cardiovascular. Obviously, you know the heart's going to be the major part. Uh, and again, the idea is this is how we move blood throughout the body. And of course, the moving of the blood throughout our body is really important to get oxygen uh, to the tissues, as well as food and other things as well. And we're going to see how they kind of all tie in. Now I have a second video for chapter 34, which is the respiratory system, and that really gets into the lungs and how blood flow uh, into the lungs actually exchanges oxygen and, and exchanges oxygen with CO2. And so we'll look at that in the second video. In this one, we're, we're primarily going to be concerned with what goes on with the heart, how does the heart work, uh, and all that, and then look at how blood flow goes throughout the body, look at the capillaries, look at the arteries and veins and capillaries and how all that works and a little bit about a gas exchange that happens uh, in the capillaries. And then we'll look at the parts of the blood. So we'll look at the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and then the plasma and even the platelets a little bit in their roles and functions in blood. And then finally, we'll spend a little bit of time just talking about uh, cardiovascular disease, what causes that and what do you see uh, and what are some of the risk factors for it? So that's kind of what we're going to do. Then the next chapter, or our next next lecture, I should say, the next lecture with chapter 34 will primarily just deal with the respiratory system, and it ties in nicely. The reason why I split it up again was just to kind of shorten the lecture. Otherwise, it'd be over 100 slides, and be like, oh, I got to sit through all this and everything else. So I try to keep it short and sweet for both of them. The cardiovascular is going to be a little bit longer because we've got a lot to talk about. And then we'll get into the respiratory system in the next video. So stay with it and everything. Hopefully everything's going well. And if again, you do have questions, please feel free to email me and, and ask, ask your questions away. All right. So let's talk about the cardiovascular system and take a look at what we're going to see today. So the first thing we're going to look at is how do car or circulatory systems work. And so again, circulation, getting blood throughout the body. And so we're really going to talk, uh, and that kind of goes with the second point, we're going to look at the difference between an open and closed system. Now, I've mentioned this before in the lab when we went through some of the animals. Most vertebrates have a closed system, meaning that they're contained with throughout, uh, blood is contained throughout the vessels. And the other thing you see is actually blood. Whereas with many of the invertebrates, they have an open system. And so we saw this with the clams. We saw this with the, uh, uh, the crayfish and that, and they have a open system where essentially they have a big heart and then they have two vessels on either side, one to kind of bring in the, the fluid and then the heart to pump. And then the heart kind of pumps it out another vessel to, into an open cavity. And so that would be considered an open system where you just pump it into an open cavity. Now in those animals, they really don't have blood. What they have is called hemocele or uh, sometimes they call it like a blood, blood lymph kind of mixture. It's more of blood. It's not really even blood because it's not, doesn't have um, all the components of blood that we think of, but it does have ways to carry oxygen in it. So it may have some type of heme groups associated, so cells that have heme groups, but most of it is lymphatic tissue or not lymphatic tissue, but lymphatic fluid and that stuff. So what we think of as lymph. And we'll talk about that a little bit today as well and look at that. So that, and then the closed system, like we've mentioned, is all contained in vessels. All those organisms have a form of blood. And we'll look at some of the different components, some of the chemicals and that stuff. And so we actually have some different colors of blood and that stuff based on the chemicals that are associated with their blood cells. And we'll, we'll get into that as we go on and talk about blood here later on. The next thing we're going to look at is how does the heart work and move blood throughout the body. So we'll talk about, again, the beating of the heart. We'll talk about the QRS wave. Uh, all those different things, the nerves that are controlling uh, the response of the beating heart, and then look at how arteries and veins, and then capillaries then circulate the blood around, and then again, releasing uh, the gas on one side, and then accepting the other gas and that on the other side of the capillary bed. So we'll talk about that. And then finally, like I said, we'll talk a little bit about the various uh, components of blood. So we'll talk about the, you know, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, the platelets, and then even plasma a little bit and talk about what's in there. And then really the last thing, and I don't have it up there, is talking about some cardiovascular disease and looking at risk factors and that. And so again, important thing to talk about, especially in humans, because that's probably probably one of the number, in the United States, the number one killer besides cancer 
uh, for most people in, in this uh, country. So we'll look at that. And again, a lot of it has to do with our diets and then in having a high fat diet and then the lack of exercise that is in becoming more sedentary is really not helping our situation in there. So we'll talk about all those different things today and what plays major factors in developing that disease. All right, so the first thing we're going to look at is, again, the circulatory systems looking at the exchange of oxygen and CO2. So that's really what the circulatory system is designed for, is to get oxygen and food to the cells that need it. And that, and so really this whole chapter is going to be focusing more, not so much on the food particles and that, which we learned about in digestion, but more about the oxygen CO2 exchange. And you can see that, again, everything works by diffusion. So we have thin membranes that are separating either the capillary or the alveoli in this situation. Or Again, we're going to talk more about that next time uh, in the next lecture. And then when you get down to the systemic capillary, again, a thin membrane separating the capillary out and allowing for gas exchange as well. And all this happens by diffusion. So simple diffusion, low concentration, or I'm sorry, high concentration to low concentration. Wherever you have a high concentration of oxygen, it's going to move to the low concentration to balance it out. And likewise, CO2 is going to move into the blood when you have a high concentration of CO2 and a low concentration in the vessel and so it moves that way and the opposite is true in the lung and again we know that uh, and again very very easy way to work now diffusion is only efficient over small distances so again they have to be very thin and so again around our lungs and, and around the tissues and the organs we have lots and lots of capillary beds so that these things can diffuse very easily otherwise if we tried to diffuse through an artery or a vein it'd be very hard to do because when you have smooth muscle you have a lot of other things that are surrounding it and so diffusion doesn't work very well getting that across because you got many layers to cross in order for that to occur. So you have to get into capillaries in order for this to actually work properly. So that's one of the things we'll, we'll look at when we get into looking at the different types of vessels. Now in smaller, or I shouldn't say smaller, but early, early invertebrates and in that early animals, they use essentially uh, a system where every cell is pretty much connected or very close to the outside layer. So a lot of times you will not see circulatory systems in the very simple animals like sponges and jellyfish and that because their cells are all very close to either the inner cavity or the outer cavity so they can do simple diffusion just by that. And so there's not a lot of layers that you have to go through. There's not a lot of tissues that you have to work your way through. So there's a way for uh, these animals to exchange directly with the surrounding medium. And so they don't need a lot of exchange units in that because again, they're very simplistic, not very many layers. And so you can easily diffuse across, across the medium with those cell layers. Now, as animals got more complex, more layers, more tissues, you start to see now the development of this gastro gastrovascular cavity now that serves not only as a stomach, but a way to move nutrients in and out and blood, or I shouldn't say blood, but move oxygen and carbon dioxide in the system so they can do cellular respiration. And so again, animals like in a simple body plan display an alternative adaptation uh, exchange a circulatory system and so again in the higher levels what you start to see is this circulatory system now this is the planaria we saw this in the lab and so this red here is not only the stomach but it's also the way that they spread their vessels out so you can kind of see that they almost look like rudimentary uh, uh, capillaries and vessels in this case and essentially what they do is they bring water in that's loaded with oxygen and then they exchange the gas, the CO2 comes out, and then they release it through the pharynx or the mouth uh, of this worm. And so again, a very simple structure. There's no blood associated in this at all, but it's a really, again, a simple way to diffuse. And you can see it really kind of shows up these very um, primitive capillary beds that you're seeing and allowing for all the cells of the organism to exchange. Now, probably the cells on the outside could just do simple diffusion as well. So we do see a lot of organisms, especially in the lower levels like the worms and some of even the um, lower level chordates and that stuff able to 
actually breathe through their skin. And so they can do gas exchange through that. And so they, they're not going to have a lung system or anything else, but they can exchange the gases through their, um, through their skin. And that allows it because it's thin enough for them to do that. The only problem with that is you got to be surrounded by water or very moist so that you don't dry out. And again, because you have thin layers, you need to protect yourself from drying out. So that's always an issue too. And so we'll look at that as we go along, especially in the respiratory system in the next lecture. Now, again, I've talked about open and closed circulatory systems before in lab, but I just want you to be aware of, again, the circulatory system, essentially you have some type of fluid, you're going to have interconnecting vessels, and you're going to have a muscular pump to get that through, whether you have an open or closed system. And we saw that. So when we looked at the clam, you saw this big ridge, kind of like a fattened artery that works as a heart. With the earthworms, we saw the aortic arches were like little pumps that pump the uh, blood and even in the bigger animals like the uh, crayfish and then when we looked at the frog you could see a much more well-defined heart and so again these are muscular essentially muscular tubes that really are able to squeeze and pump the blood throughout and so whether you're open or closed you're going to have this type of system now in insects and other arthropods there's and some mollusks the circulatory system bathes the organs directly in an open circulatory system and like i said this is called hemolymph and again or heal or sometimes it's called hemocele so you may hear it like that that's kind of the cavity that you see around it but the hemolymph is kind of a mixture of blood and lymph together and we'll look at what lymph is here in a little while that's just the extracellular fluid that leaks out of vessels and that and so again Typically in an open circulatory system, you're going to see the hemolymph, which is kind of the mixture of the two. And it's not really blood because, again, most of it is oxygen being carried in uh, by some type of heme group. Could be some cells that carry heme in that, but it's not really hemoglobin in this case that we think of. And then the lymph is the, is the cellular fluid, which they're kind of bathed in, in that. So that's kind of what you see here. So again, what we saw in the insects, the crayfish, uh, the clams, what we saw is they have a, a big heart in this case, and then they have this vessel coming out and it pumps the hemolymph into the sinuses and the surrounding tissues. So you can see here, it's starting to get organized, but these tubes are open-ended. And so what they do is they pump the blood into this and then all the organs are bathed. And so that's why a lot of times when you squish a bug, they're kind of juicy in that stuff because that's the hemolymph that's kind of bathing their organs. So that's how they get oxygen and everything exchanged. Now, at the end, they have these little pores around their heart, and that's how the fluid comes back in. So sometimes you'll see other vessels on the other side where the fluid actually kind of funnels in and then gets to the heart. But in this case with the insects, you see they have multiple hearts, okay, so a tubular heart, and then they have pores on the side that bring the fluid in, so it allows it to be pumped out again. And so again, there's really no lungs or anything else. Now, you know, with the um, insects, and we're going to talk about this in the next chapter, they have the spiracles and the tracheae that allow them to exchange gas. And we'll look at that next time. But again, for the fluid itself, they use an open circulatory system in this case. Now, what we're mostly thinking about, if we think about mammals or higher vertebrates, and even some lower invertebrates, they do have a closed circulatory system. We saw evidence of this with the earthworm. So we saw the aortic arches and they had the two blood vessels that were kind of like rings all the way around in every segment and that, and that's kind of the gas exchange. We also saw, um, again, in the frog, we also saw in the pigs and that stuff that those are all closed systems, meaning that there, there's no leakage of fluid unless we're talking about the capillary bed. And again, we're going to look at that. But really, the blood stays inside the vessel. It doesn't leave the vessel and it goes from the air arteries to the capillaries, back to the veins and then back to the heart. And so we'll see that as well. And then you have uh, interstitial fluid that's outside that leaks out of the vessel and again that bathes the cells and that and a lot of times that's how food gets in but really the gas exchange and that stuff the blood stays into the uh the cardiovascular the circulatory system and so again that's the difference between an open and closed open you're just kind of filling filling the cavities up with fluid and then the gas exchange happens there whereas in the closed you have the arteries the veins and then the capillaries where the gas exchange happens and blood really doesn't leave the system at all but some fluid does leave and we'll talk about that as we go on so and again a closed circulatory system typically you have the heart 
and then you have the arteries, then you have a small branch of vessels in each organ, and then the blood gets returned to the heart so it can be pumped again. Now, in the earthworm, the interesting thing, yes, they have a closed circulatory system, but they don't have lungs or anything else. What they do is they breathe through their skin. So the vessels are constantly getting oxygen uh, through the blood, through their skin. And so the oxygen's coming in as CO2 is being entered in. And again, CO2 will leave the skin as it raises up in the in the concentration. And so you can see that it has, again, a closed system. You have ventral vessels, you have dorsal. And again, typically the blood flow is, the blood flow goes out the ventral vessels from the heart down and through, and then it returns back through the dorsal vessel. And so again, they're not really called arteries and veins because again, they're filling up with oxygen all the time and that and through the circulation through the skin. So it's a little bit different than in a human system where we know we have different arteries and veins and, and definite roles what they are. But that's kind of how we associate it with the earthworm. And so the dorsal kind of going back, the ventral kind of going out from the body in that. And so we'll, we'll look at this more as we go on uh, throughout. Okay, so now when we get into the higher vertebrates, again, we start to see the closed system. And again, we'll talk about uh, how the muscles work in that here in a few minutes. But again, humans and other vertebrates have the closed circulatory system. Again, we have a connection of uh, vessels. And so you have the arteries, which always move away from the heart. You have the capillaries in the vein, which return the blood to the heart. And again, typically in, in uh, higher vertebrates, you're going to have a two system uh, two system circulatory system, meaning that you have a pulmonary system that goes to the lungs where you get gas exchange, and then you have a systemic system that runs blood throughout the rest of the heart. And we'll talk about this more here in a few minutes, but this is kind of what you see. So you see a two system way. Now, again, the other, the other thing to remember is that blood only flows in one direction. And again, when you're called an artery, you're moving away from the heart, okay? So, and again, you can't always go with the red versus blue because that doesn't play, that isn't the truth when we talk about the arteries in the veins going to the lungs and coming back from the heart, or from the lungs. But again, for the most case, the, the arteries are gonna be the red ones, the capillaries are gonna be kind of the purple, and then the blue are gonna be the veins. But really how we name the arteries and veins is whether it's going away from the heart or towards the heart. And so that's the rule of thumb in these situations. And again, the blood can only flow in one direction in these situations. And we'll see why that is here in a little while, and we'll talk about that, okay? Again, I've already mentioned arteries and capillaries in that and again they carry blood away from the heart capillaries do the gas exchange and then veins bring it back to the heart and again not much more i need to explain here and probably you know a lot of this already from other classes that you've taken but again it's always good to remember arteries away from the heart capillaries are where the gas exchange take place and veins back to the heart okay and then again arteries and veins are distinguished by the direction of blood flow not the o2 content because again the pulmonary arteries are moving away from the heart and they have low oxygen and not until they get oxygen from the lungs and now the pulmonary veins actually have red. So that's where the one area where arteries and veins are kind of switched. And even though arteries are moving away from the heart, they're blue and then the veins are red moving back. But normally we associate it with the color in that situation or the oxygen content. Okay, and so again, Vertebrate hearts contain two or more chambers. We're going to talk about that here in a second. But typically you have atria and ventricles. And so that's going to be the difference between it. So atria, kind of like the atrium, blood comes in when you atria in a house. That's where the front door is and you walk in. You may have a little hallway or an atrium. And that's kind of like where you walk into. So that's kind of where they disguise or describe that in the heart. So blood comes into this. And then the ventricle is what pumps the blood out to either the lungs or to the rest of the body. And again, we'll talk about uh, the numbers here in just a second. Now, some organisms just have single circulation. And so what they do is essentially they have a two-chambered heart. Okay, so they have a two-chamber where they have an atrium and a ventricle. So blood comes in and then blood leaves through the ventricle. And you can see they have the little, again, the little um, doorways in that that hold or keep blood from going backwards in that. And we'll talk about that, the little um, doors and that stuff and valves and that stuff in there. And then in this case with the fish, what happens is that the blood goes to the gills or capillaries. 
they get oxygenated and we're going to talk a little bit about that in again circulation how that all works and then they get oxygenated and then it travels throughout the rest of the body now the problem with this is that again the size of the heart is going to depend on the size of the animal and we've seen some very large fish in that but the problem again is you got to pump it through the gills and then it's got to make it throughout the rest of the body so you're kind of limited on size based on the heart and so that's going to be the issue and this is why we're going to see a double circulation actually being more efficient and actually a better to get larger animals and so that's one of the things to think about when you only have a two chambered heart now like i said double circulation really for all the upper vertebrates in this case including amphibians reptiles birds and mammals again because you get better efficiency and better blood flow in these situations now in amphibians reptiles in mammals we have the double circulation like i said more efficiency and again oxygen poor and oxygen rich blood is pumped separately from the right and left sides of the heart now this one's interesting in the frogs they actually have a three chambered heart where they have the two atria and then they have one ventricle going by so you actually get a mixing of the blood here and that makes it a little less efficient and so again this is why uh, mammals have mammals and birds have developed a four chambered heart and again that uh, limits the amount of mixing of blood and so you get even better efficiency and so the lower vertebrates you're going to see a double system but what you're going to see is still a mixing of the blood because they only have three chambers and so that's kind of the interesting part and again the having both pumps within the heart simplifies the coordination and the pumping cycle so now you can pump to the lung and the skin capillaries and then pump it back and then go throughout so again making it more efficient because you do a double pump uh, again one pumping to where you're going to exchange the gases and then the next one where you're going to get it throughout the rest of the body and so you have a pulmonary uh, circuit and then you have a systemic circuit as well. So we'll talk about that. Now in mammals, like I said, uh, you have the double circulation and again, the two types of circuits. You have the systemic circuit, which is going throughout the body. And then you have the pulmonary circuit, which is going to the lungs. And again, in most mammals, uh, again, they don't have gills, but they have lungs. And again, that's where the gas exchange takes place. And again, in this situation, this is the pulmonary arteries. And these are the pulmonary veins bringing it back and then coming out this is going to be the aorta going in and sending out blood and then you have really the vena cava going back to the heart and again we're going to talk more about the vessels here in a little while but this is kind of giving you an idea and you can see it's a double circuit and again with that thick wall in between you separate the oxygen poor blood from the oxygen rich blood and so that's going to be the big difference and so you get more efficiency not only with the double circuit but without the mixing of the blood in these situations now there are some vertebrates that have double circulation that have in, or that are intermediate breathers and so examples of this especially with the um, mammals that are underwater which means they can hold their breath for a long period of time some seals can go about 20 minutes or whales 20 to 30 minutes under the water and i think even whales they can go longer like a couple hours and that and so they have ways to uh, adapt and basically enable their circuitary, circulatory system to completely bypass uh, the lungs because they don't need the oxygen they hold it in and one of the ways they use is they've got very good myoglobin in the muscles so they can continue to do uh, aerobic respiration in the muscles even though uh, they're not breathing at the time and so there you got really good myoglobin in the muscles to hold that oxygen in and so they can continue to do aerobic respiration and so they don't need to take a breath until they necessarily you know until all that's used up and then they can do the gas exchange and so that's a big thing with that and so you see that a lot of times with the marine mammals and that in these situations now again with the different chambers so we'll talk about this so the double circulation and again the, the frogs typically have a three chambered heart where you have a mixing of the blood and so we'll see this when we looked at the frogs that the, again the three chambers where they have the two atria and one ventricle so the ventricle does both jobs a pumping to the lung and skin capillaries and then also pumping the blood out so you get a mixing of the blood even though it shows it's kind of purple but you're going to get some oxygenated blood that goes through here and you're going to get some unoxygenated blood blood or oxygen poor blood even in the systemic capillaries and so again it's not as efficient and so that is that's one of the, the issues there another interesting with frogs is they can breathe through their skin and so you can actually shut uh, the blood flow off from the lungs so that they can just breathe through the skin and again change that through through the water so again frogs are another 
example of those that can spend lots of time underwater. And again, that's one of the reasons why they have to keep their skin moist is so they don't dry out because it's a very thin skin and it allows for uh, uh, exchange of oxygen and CO2 through their skin as well. And again, we're going to look at this in the next chapter and look at those different things. Now, as we move on to higher level vertebrates and look at the reptiles, again, a lot of these have three chambered hearts. Um, and you start to see these septa in, in some of them, but you do see uh, little areas where they can actually um, exchange without going to the lungs. And so you can see here, uh, you have in this situation with a lizard, you have the right and left atrium on the same side. And so oxygen poor blood goes into the left ventricle and then works its way through and goes to the pulmonary artery and then comes back and then it goes into the left atrium that allows it to go through. And so you can kind of see that it's kind of almost like a backward system. And again, not very efficient, but it allows it for it to happen. A snake, again, the right and left are kind of on the same side. You start to see a little bit of a septum uh, here. But again, what allows it for is now the aortas are now on the right side. And so, again, you're pumping the blood through. And again, you're getting a mixing of the blood. And then really in the same thing with the turtles, you start to see a little bit of a septum. But again, the right and left uh, atria are on the same side. And then what you have, again, is the pumping of the blood. Now, the right aorta is on the left ventricle. The left aorta is in the right ventricle. And so again, you see this again where you get some mixing of the blood in that. Now, the closest one to birds and mammals is going to be the crocodile. And again, they have a little bit, they, they start now with the right and left atrium on both sides. They have the right and left ventricle. They do have a membrane between it, but they have this thing called the foramen uh, pienza, pienza, which is a, basically a hole between the two aortas so they can ex exchange. Uh, blood. Now, again, typically some blood will get pumped into the left aorta as well through here. And then, uh, so that would be oxygen poor, but you also see that it can cross over from the left ventricle in that. And again, um, not as not as efficient, but you're starting to see where you're starting to develop the four chambered heart. And so slowly but surely you get to there and you can kind of see it as it goes. And again, this connection is temporarily shut when you can uh, close when you don't need it from the lungs. And so that's really the reason why you see it set up this way, because the lungs are not always important because some of them can breathe through their skin. Others can kind of hold their breath for a while. And again, through the myoglobin and that, so they don't have to come up and breathe all the time. And so that's where you're seeing this, this done this way. And again, I'm just kind of taking you through how these different circulations, but you're just remember the reason why they do this in the first place is that they can shut off the really shut off the blood going into the, the lungs and be able to just pump it throughout the systemic system. And so that's one of the reasons why uh, they do it this way. And so that's what you see. Okay, now again, in mammals and birds, they have the four chambered heart. So we always have to pump blood to our lungs. We can't bypass that. And so again, they're again, keeping the relative blood flow. Again, the right side is gonna be pumping the blood to the lungs, whereas the left side is gonna be pumping the systemic throughout the rest of the body. Again, there's no mechanism to vary the relative blood flow to the lungs and the body because again, there's no there's no pathways to cross in this case. And again, mammals and, and birds are endotherms and they require more O2 than ectotherms. So again, a reason why uh, we have this closed system as again, more efficiency because we need more O2 to keep our body temperature up. Whereas the ectotherms, again, they can shut off the blood flow to the lungs. They don't need to take as many breaths. And so they can shut that system down. So again, maintain the oxygen in there. And they don't need as much because they're more regulated with the temperature on the outside. And so you see that as it goes on. Okay, so again, mammalian circulation, we've talked about this a number of times. So again, as we start off in the uh, left, I guess they started here in the left, or I'm sorry, in the right atrium, the blood flows into the uh, pulmonary arteries, which again are uh, poor oxygenated. They go to the capillaries of the lung where they become oxygenated and then they get into the uh, left atrium down into the left ventricle and then pumped out through the aorta, which can go up to the head and then also down to the legs. And then again, the blood goes through the capillaries and then returns on either one. So in humans, we have the superior vena cava and then the inferior vena cava. 
in other animals like the pigs and other things because they're tetrapods, meaning they, they stand on all four legs, they have what is called an anterior vena cava, which is essentially goes from the head down, and then they have the posterior, which is basically from the butt back up. So again, from the butt and legs back up to the heart. And so because humans are bipedals, we call it inferior and superior in the case of where they're coming from. So superior coming from the head, inferior coming from the legs. Okay, and so that's kind of how they describe the difference between those. Now, I've already talked about this, so we've already mentioned this, so I'll just skip this. But again, this is the idea going through in the blood circulation, again, through the circulatory system. Now, the heart contracts and relaxes in a rhythmic cycle. And again, when it contracts, it's pumping the blood. And when it relaxes, it's filling up with blood. And you can see, just looking at the heart, uh, just kind of give you an idea, the right ventricle is not going to be as muscular just because it only has to pump to the lungs. Where the left ventricle, you can see, is very thick and muscular in that it's actually very compact. And the reason for that is so it can really get a good squeeze to pump it throughout the rest of the body. And so you think of animals that are very large, the heart's going to be very large to pump the blood. And we do see what happens when people have heart conditions. A lot of times their heart will actually grow to bigger to handle blood flow. So when they're not getting enough oxygen to the rest of the body, or you're seeing things happen, a lot of times you see an enlargement of the heart because it's not working as efficiently as it does. And so it has to grow to accommodate to make sure circulation is still happening. Now, when we think about this, so the filling and contraction of the blood, that is called the uh, cardiac cycle. So the filling of the blood and then the squeezing of the ventricles to pump the blood out, that is considered a cardiac cycle. And again, when you squeeze, you're squeezing both ventricles. So the blood is not only going to the lungs, but it's also going throughout the body. And so that's the contraction that you see. You don't have two different contractions going on in this situation. They squeeze together and they contract. Now the contraction phase of the cardiac uh, cycle is called systole. So again, that's when it squeezes. And so you can see here, again, you're filling up the blood and then you squeeze, you squeeze both to the pulmonary circuit and then the systemic circuit. So that's about three seconds long and that's the big wave that you see on the QRS wave and then you have the refilling of the blood. Now when relaxing, relaxation occurs, you have uh, diastole. So diastole is when you fill up the blood. So you have systole, which is squeezing, diastole where it's filling. So again, filling and squeezing, and you can see uh, in these situations that you have um, uh, diastole here, you have uh, systole, and then diastole again. So again, you can kind of see where it's filling up the blood. And so during the first run, you're filling up uh, again, arterial systole and di ventricular diastole, where in this situation, uh, systole is pumped the blood into the ventricle, and so that's about one second. And then you have the second part, where now the refilling of the blood here, so you have diastole here in the atrium, and then ventricular systole, where it squeezes the blood through, and then you have the refilling uh, of both chambers again. So now you have atrial and ventri uh, ventricular diastole uh, refilling the blood, and that's about four seconds. So typically a heartbeat is every uh, five to seven seconds, and again, that's going to be the pulse rate in that. And the more fit you are and the more uh, efficient your heart is beating, you actually have uh, a slower heartbeat in this case where you're not, uh, your, your heartbeat, your pulse is not nearly as fast as someone that has multiple pumps throughout and so a higher pulse rate. Okay, now cardiac volume depends on both the heart rate and the stroke volume and the cardiac output is determined by the heart rate beats per minute and the stroke volume here. And so again, this is just showing you a little bit what can control the, the cardiac output in this case. And the cardiac output, remember, is the amount of blood going through per minute. And so that's what you're looking at as a cardiac output. And again, this is determined by the heart rate, which is beats per minute. So how many times does your heart squeeze? And then the stroke volume, how much blood is actually going through each time it, it beats. And so again, you can see different things that affect this. So the heart rate is affected by not only nerves, and we'll talk about that, but also hormones, especially epinephrine. So again, when you get excited and that your heart rate will go up. Now the volume can be controlled by the blood volume and vascular resistance. And again, people that have high blood pressure and other things, they're gonna be uh, having more issues because again, the stroke volume, and that's again, where you a lot of times will see an enlargement of the heart to come and compensate uh, for the vascular resistance. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on as well. Okay, and then the four valves prevent the backflow. Again, you have the atrioventricular valves or the AV valves, and so you have 
one atrioventricular valve here, and then you have the other atrioventricular valve, where is it? Is this pointing right here? And so that's here. And typically you'll hear it either as the, um, uh, sometimes you'll hear it as the um, uh, multiple valves, and so you'll you'll see it as that and refer to that. Or you may hear it as like the bicuspid versus the tricuspid valves. And then again, the semilunar valves are on the top. And again, these typically are two because they look like little moons and then they open and close this way and that. And so you see how they, again, kind of close back on each other. So they kind of open and close like this, like revolving doors in that and then open and close this way. Okay, so semilunar because they kind of look like moons, and then you have the atrioventricular because they're in between the atrium and the ventricle in both those cases. Now the lub-dub sound of the heartbeat is caused by the recoil of the AV valves. That's the lub. So again, what you see is that the doors open, so they go and they open up, and then they close. And so that's the lub part where you get the blood uh, hitting the, the valves. And then the dub is uh, the against the semilunar. So when the blood, so when these things close again, and the blood hits it, and so you hear it open, and then it closes. And so when the blood hits those valves, that's the lub dub that you hear when you take a chest, you take a stethoscope to the chest, and you're hearing the valves open and close, open and close, open and close. And so that's what you're hearing. Now you can get situations where blood does move back, and that is called a murmur. And so a lot of times people have valve defects where they don't close all the way. So you may have a thickened or abnormal blood that impedes the blood flow, or you have a leaky valve where it's now leaking backwards. And so when you have those situations, a lot of times when you have bad valves, you have, you're going into what is called heart failure or in those situations. So a lot of times they will try and fix the valve so that you're not getting uh, blood flow back. And again, we'll talk more about that as we go on and, and do these things. Now, there are some situations, like I said, where typically in humans, we don't have this cross circulation. Now, as a, as a developing fetus, okay, so in those situations, we actually do have a septal hole. So there is a hole. It's called the foramen ovale. And again, that thing is open because we don't really use our lungs when we're developing. And so the heart is there to pump the blood. And so we really go into almost like a, even though we have the four chambered heart and we talk about that, we're really going in as a three chambered heart because again, the blood by uh, kind of crosses and skips the uh, left atria because it goes essentially into the right atria, the right ventricle, and then blood moves into the left ventricle and then out the body because we're not using our lungs when we're um, uh, developing as a fetus. But as soon as the baby takes its first breath, this hole is supposed to close. It's supposed to close up nice and tight and that now you get the double circulation. Sometimes this doesn't happen where the hole doesn't fully close or it only partially closes and so you still get a leaking of the blood from the left ventricle into the right and then the right also leaks into the left. And so when you have those, you have what is called a septal defect and a lot of times they'll have to go in and do surgery. So they look at that and they do things to kind of fix fix that situation. So again, that can play a role. And sometimes they don't know about it until they start seeing it. Or you see where the athlete collapses or something where, again, they're not getting the efficient blood. And so they collapse and potentially could die from that. And so that's due to a heart defect that they never had diagnosed as a child. And so that can happen as well. Okay, so again, some cardiac muscle cells are autorhythmic, meaning they can contract without any signal in the nervous system. But again, most of the cells are, con are contracted by the sinoatrial node, which is the pacemaker that sets the rate and timing of all the cardiac muscle cells to contract. And so again, it keeps the beats. And so again, it keeps it and it keeps everything coordinated that way. And again, the SA node produces electrical impulses that spread rapidly through the heart and can be recorded as an electrocardiogram or ECG or EKG. So again, that's the little QRS wave that we're going to look at here in a minute, and we'll explain what that is. And again, that's typically what they look for if there's any issues with the heart. They look at the EKG to make sure that everything is okay. So what is the EKG? So again, they're describing as ECG or EKG. That's fine. But essentially what happens is you have this SA node that gets the signal from the brain. And again, this is not you consciously thinking about pump your heart, but actually from the brain stem and the medulla in the back, which controls this. And so what it does is it sends an electrical impulse to the SA node to beat and says, okay, you start at the atria. And then that's the small little wave that you see here. The atria then fill up 
And then you have the next one where again, it sends to the AV node, which is then gonna send the signal down to the rest of it. And that's this right here. And then again, then you have the bundle branches and the hard apex where again, they're getting the electrical signal signaling to contract. And that's that little dip right here that you see. And then finally you see the um, Purkinje, bund or Purkinje fibers off the side of the heart, which now cause the contraction and that's the big wave. And so essentially these are the valves. And so again, this is the lub dub. And then this right here is essentially the contraction of the heart. And so that's what you're seeing there. And th these are really the filling, filling the heart. And so you get again, the atrial filling, and then you have the ventricle filling. And then this is the contraction that you see when you see the QRS wave. Okay, and so again, the impulses from the SA node travel to the uh, atrioventricular node, and at the AV node, the impulses are delayed and then travel to the per, uh, uh, Purkinje fibers, which make the ventricles contract. And so again, just kind of showing you the same thing. It starts at the SA node, which again, gets a signal from the brain, and then it sends it down to the AV node, which then goes down to the Purkinje fibers, which then cause the ventricle to contract and squeeze the blood. And so you get the heart, and that's the ECG. So if we do see abnormalities, sometimes people, if, if it's not beating right, or you're getting these really weird waves and you have an irregular heartbeat, that's what they're looking at. They're looking at the ECG to make sure your heartbeat is normal, everything is fine. Uh, they can look and see, sometimes they can see murmurs that way and other things going on, or you may have multiple beats and other things that are going on. And so it's not working correctly. So you're not getting the right uh, signals. And so a lot of times what they may do is they may um, freeze some nerves to prevent the overreaction of some nerves of the heart, or they may go in and they, if the nerves are not firing correctly, what they may do is put in a pacemaker. And so essentially that's an, uh, uh, a little electrode that they essentially put into the chest wall. And what it does is it sends, the, instead of the brain sending it, it sends the electrical beats to the heart so that it beats properly. And so that kind of bypasses the brain signal and then uses the pacemaker. And sometimes it can be just to make sure that the heartbeat gets back back to normal. So it may be only used when you when the body senses or the pacemaker senses the irregular heartbeat, then it sends a little jolt and then it will cause it to go back to the normal condition and then still use the brain stem. Other times it may be that they completely uh, sever that node and what they do is just can completely rely on the pacemaker, pacemaker to keep the heart beating. And so again, it just depends on how serious the irregular heartbeat is in those situations. Now, other cues, physiological cues acting on the nervous system alter the heart tempo, and we talked about this. And so you have the sympathetic nerve coming from the brain. Again, the medulla is what's causing this. So the medulla is back here. And again, the medulla is sending through the sympathetic nerve, the heart rate. And again, it can increase the number of things if it needs to increase the heart rate. You also have the vagus nerve, which will actually shut down the signal. And so you can regulate it through uh, the brain and the brain stem kind of controlling the heart rate when it needs to pump more or less again when you're working and, and moving physically and that stuff. You also have the, the hormones and one of them being adrenaline and epinephrine produced by the adrenal glands. And again, those things can increase the heart rate, also vasodilation, which opens up the vessels and that in the smooth muscle and allows for a faster heart rate and higher blood pressure. So we see that as a chemical mediator. So again, we talked about this before, how the nervous system it uses electrical impulses. The uh, endocrine system uses chemical messages. And again, they both work very similarly on either increasing the heart rate or slowing down the heart rate, depending on how those things are. And so again, that's another way where you can see that both systems are kind of working together to influence the heart. Okay, so now we'll talk a little bit about the vessels themselves. We talked about the heart, how the heart pumps. Now let's talk a little bit about the vessel structure. So again, you have the two vessels, the two main vessels. You have the arteries, which again are moving away from the heart. And then you have the veins, which are moving towards the heart. Now, typically when people look at the arteries, the arteries are going to be thicker because they have a lot more smooth muscle around them. And again, that's because they need to pump the blood throughout the rest of the body. And so from the heart, they need to have that muscular tone to keep the blood flowing to make sure it gets through all the capillaries. Then in the vein, there's not a lot of blood flow there, or not, I shouldn't say a lot of blood flow, but you still do have a layer of connective tissue and muscle tissue around it. It's just not as thick as the artery. And so again, you see that 
veins tend to be a little bit wider as well and then you also have these valves that make sure blood only flows in one direction so that's the big thing now on the inside you do have a smooth layer of cells called the endothelium so it's a lot like the epithelial tissue that we've talked about in the past again it lines the layers of the vessel and again it's smooth so that the blood flows uh, normally so you want it nice and smooth so that the blood doesn't get hung up or the blood cells get hung up and you can kind of see this as the blood cells are running through a capillary again the capillaries have very little uh, muscle whatsoever what they're going to have is just endothelium and the basal lamina which is essentially the connective tissue on the outside because you need to do diffusion if you had layers of muscle around it it would be very hard to do diffusion and so capillaries really don't have any muscle around that whatsoever and again we're going to talk more about this here as well as in circulation or in uh, the respiratory system in the next uh, lecture as well so again, the capillaries are thin, the endothelium and the basal lamina allow for exchange of substances. The arteries and veins have the endothelium, the smooth muscle, and then the connective tissue around that. Again, arteries have thicker walls and veins accommodate the higher pressure of blood pumped to the heart. And also you don't want to have blood, so that's the other reason why you have thicker walls because again, the pressure from the heart the blood pressure in that so that you don't blow out a vessel and that stuff and so we'll talk about that here in a few minutes as well but again and then the veins return the blood flow back to the heart now again blood flow velocity again the blood vessel diameter influences blood flow and again the velocity of the blood flow is slowest in the capillary beds as a result of the high resistance in the cross-sectional area and again blood flow in capillaries is necessarily slow to allow you to exchange mater uh, materials and so you can kind of see how the um, again the area is very small in the arteries where you have lots of area in the capillaries and again that area returns small uh, in the veins as well and then the velocity you can see that the velocity is very high because of the heart again it slows down in the capillaries and then it returns because again you're small you're shrinking the the area and then you're getting the blood uh, back and then you can again see the diastolic pressure the diastolic pressure here is um, again from the heart where you can see the uh, refilling of the heart and the systolic pressure is the contraction and so that's really the pulse that you're feeling in the artery and again the pressure and that stuff and that's what they're measuring when they measure your um, your uh, again your blood pressure because they're looking at what's the highest pressure what is it when the heart pumps versus what is the pressure when the blood is being filled up in the heart and so you can measure those things and then again veins don't have that because they're just returning all the blood back to to the heart in the in the situation as well so you lose that pressure as it goes on and again blood flows from areas of higher pressure to areas of lower pressure and the blood pressure pressure exerts force in all directions and so again you need thick arteries so that it doesn't blow out and so that's one of the issues and again in capillaries at the start of the capillary where you still have high oxygen you have good blood pressure but by the end by the time you leave the capillaries the blood pressure has diminished greatly and that's really what's used for exchange of oxygen in that it's not osmotic pressure or diffusion but it's actually the blood pressure that allows to drive the fluids and exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide throughout the system Okay, so again, arterial blood pressure is the highest when the heart contracts, that's systole. And again, the pulse is the rhythmic bulging of the artery walls after with each heartbeat. And so that's what you're feeling when you feel your pulse, is again, the blood being pumped through, and that's the pressure going through. During diastole, again, the elastic walls are there, snap back, and so you feel that during the pressure. So you feel the bulging of the blood going through, and then it's snapping back, and so that's what you're feeling. Again, arteries remain pressurized throughout the cardiac cycle, so blood flows continuously through the atrials and capillaries. And so again, you want to keep that pressure so that the blood maintains and keeps going in one direction. You don't want it to start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. And the reason for that is, again, you want to make sure the oxygen gets to the capillaries as well as you don't want to have any any reason why the blood's going to stop because when it does, the platelets that you have in your blood can get activated and actually cause uh, you to clog your vessels. And so we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. So it's important to keep the system pressurized. Okay, some other maintenance of blood pressure. So again, we have the vasoconstriction and vasodilation, and this could be based on temperature, could also be uh, based on, um, again, 
certain hormones that are being released to cause this to happen. And again, typically, when we're talking about adrenaline and epinephrine, what that does is it causes vasodilation to happen in the skin so people get flush. And so you can tell they get warm, and that it means more blood flow to the organs and that stuff in the muscles so that they're going to move. And so typically you see that. And then vasoconstriction happens when you get cold because, again, it's going to try and limit the blood and keep the blood warm in the core and then limit it from the extremities. And so you see this vasoconstriction. And so when you're cold, your hands and your legs feel cold and that. And so that can be also a problem with uh, diabetes and that stuff, which is another topic on another day. But again, you can get poor, uh, poor um, uh, circulation in those situations too when you see that. So again, relaxation of smooth muscles allows for more blood going in and heat loss, whereas with vasoconstriction, you constrict the muscle, so limit the amount of blood through the capillaries in this time. Now, vasoconstriction and dilation help maintain adequate blood flow throughout the body, demands change. Nitric oxide is a major inducer of vasodilation. And so again, that's why if you hear someone that has issues with their heart, a lot of times they're put on things like nitroglycerin and that stuff because what it does is it allows for the vascular vascularity and vasodilation of the blood vessel. And so that's what happens. More blood flow goes in, so it lowers the pressure. So if you can open up the vessel more, you lower the pressure. And so a lot of times you see that. Um, another interesting one, and I'll just mention it here, was uh, the whole little blue pill. So if you think about the the um, good old uh, pills that are out there for, again, a lot of times erectile dysfunction and that, and that's going to be another topic for another day. But those drugs that are out there, those are all nitric oxide uh, synthesizers. And what they do is they actually stimulate. And so the original reason for, or the original development of those drugs, and I can't think of the name offhand, and so you'll remember that the good old blue pill, um, essentially what that is, was it was designed for people with heart issues and that stuff. But they found when they were giving it to patients, uh, you know, as these trials that it did something else. And so, so, and, and again, it caused, uh, again, rectile dysfunction. Now, guys that were having that could now have an erection. And so what they found was that it actually stimulated the vasodilation in the penis and so allowed for men to have an erection. And so they do find that at Viagra, now I'm just thinking about it, Viagra the pill. So it was originally designed as a heart drug, but it turned out that it had a, a very interesting side effect. And so now it's prescribed more for erectile dysfunction than a heart drug. But the whole idea there was the nitric oxide. So what it does is it causes vasodilation and helps lower the blood pressure. The other drug that's there, uh, there are other peptide is in, in endothelian, which again lowers uh, uh, lower or causes vasoconstriction. So the body will uh, release nitric oxide a lot of times to dilate the blood and then use this endo, endothelian to vasoconstrict it. And so again, there's a lot of things and you can see some antagonists and other other drugs that are out there to stop or reduce the, the vascular or allow for vasodilation rather constriction. And so again, you can see some are positive. And again, these guys are all antagonists, meaning that these prevent uh, constriction from going on in, the, in these cases. So we talked about angiotensin uh, in the kidneys. And so this is one way, uh, again, for higher blood pressure. So again, that's one that uh, stimulates whether or not you need more water in the system or not and again affects blood pressure and then this endothelian also uh, is one that stimulates vasoconstriction so if you block it you can avoid vasoconstriction and, and maintain vasodilation in these situations so that's what we're looking at here okay other maintenance of blood pressure again uh, one of the things that can happen is fainting and so a lot of times people will faint when they don't get enough blood to the brain a lot of times you feel kind of foggy and other things and then all of a sudden it all goes dark and then you pass out and so that's what a lot of times happens when there's not enough blood to the heart and so again a lot of that can be not eating and other things and so glucose levels and other things can have an effect on that as well Again, animals with long necks, so you're probably thinking of giraffes, have to have a higher systolic pressure to pump the blood against gravity, again, to go up to the head and that stuff. And that's one of the things why we have a strong heartbeat, uh, again, a lot of times is to fight gravity in these situations. And again, gravity is a consideration for blood flow in the veins, uh, particularly in the legs. And so again, skeletal muscle. And so one of the things I will mention here is a lot of times people, especially on long plane rides and that stuff, 
and sitting is bad for you. And so that's why uh, they always say to get up and move. Not only is it bad for you for gaining weight, but it's also bad for you because it limits the circulation in the lung or in uh, limits the circulation in the legs. And so people that are on long flights, a lot of times won't get up at all. And so what happens is because of the lack of muscle movement, blood pools in these veins. And what that does is it triggers what is called a deep vein thrombosis. And so what happens is you, you cause the blood to clot and then that clot can become dislodged, move in, and then you get what is called a pulmonary and not pulmonary aneurysm, but pulmonary, um, I can't think of the word now, but essentially where you get a blood clot in the lungs or you can get a blood clot to the brain or in the heart itself and cause you to have a heart attack or stroke in that way. And so those are bad. Um, I keep thinking aneurysm, but it's not aneurysm and that that's, that's when the blood vessel opens. But again, so what they do recommend, especially if you're on a long flight, is to get up and move around just so that the blood doesn't pool in your veins and actually you use your muscles and your legs to squeeze the blood back to the heart and that stuff. And so that's one of the things that you see in these situations. So again, not only does the vein use, because it doesn't have as much smooth muscle, but it uses your skeletal muscle to pump the blood up to the, up back to the heart. Now, again, in capillary function, blood flows only about 5 to 10% of the body's capillaries at a time, and the major organs are usually filled to capacity. So, again, the liver, the lungs, the kidneys are always going to be filled with blood because those are where important things with the capillaries happen the brain. Those things are going to be filled. Uh, and then again, blood supplies varies in many other sites because, again, they may not be needed at all the time. And so you see differences a lot, especially like the intestines and other parts of the stomach. And that, especially when they're not needed or not used at the time, the blood flow to those areas are not going to be nearly as high uh, as if it was digesting and doing other things at that time. Okay, now again, two mechanisms alter blood flow in capillary beds, vasoconstriction or dilation of the atrial that supplies the capillary bed is a big thing. And then there are also precapillary sphincters and rings of smooth muscle that, uh, again, open and close and regulate the passage of blood. And so, again, changing the pressure. And so when they're not needed, you can close it off. When you need it, you can open it up. And so that's the idea. And typically, and like I said, uh, again, it's not osmotic pressure. And I think it, in the next uh, slide, we're actually going to talk more about this it's really the blood pressure that drives drives in. So you can see here you have a positive pressure here that pushes the fluid and the oxygen out. And then mid capillary, you don't get much movement at all. And then the low pressure here in the venous, uh, and you're gonna see reabsorption of uh, not only uh, waste, but also carbon dioxide because of the blood pressure. So it goes from a positive 10 to a negative seven here. And so you can see, you get the loss of blood pressure during out. And I showed you that in that curve as well. And again, it's the blood pressure that drives the fluid out of capillaries. Capillaries are leaky. And so that's the other thing we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, and again, blood pressure is usually greater than osmotic pressure. So even though you have more uh, solutes in the blood, because of the blood pressure, you're pushing things out. And that's what causes that to push out. And then as the pressure lowers, now it can reabsorb those things, the um, fluid, that's lost, it can also reabsorb some waste products from the cells as well as the oxygen as well. So those are the things that you see. Now, not all the fluid returns. And so there's gotta be another system in order for the fluid to return. So that's where you start to see this thing called the lymphatic system. And you may know a little bit about this, you may not, but the lymphatic system really has two rules to it. So it's really a third set of valves and, and tubes that you have throughout your body. And so what it does is it helps get the extracellular fluid that your vessels have lost in the capillary beds back into circulation. And so it's another kind of like, as we call it, a drainage system. But it's also important for, uh, again, scanning a lot of your defense mechanisms. And so we'll talk a little bit more about this again in our defenses. But when we look at the lymph nodes and that, those are kind of areas, think of those as staging areas for your B and T cells to sit and monitor. And so they're kind of, if you think about a wastewater treatment plant, so I, I always love talking about this because I'm a microbiologist. And so you think about what wastewater treatment plants do is they basically monitor the water coming in, which is dirty. And then they look at the water going out, which is clean. And so they've got to monitor that. Or you can think of a water treatment plant, same way water comes in dirty and it leaves clean. Essentially, that's what these lymph nodes do. What happens is the water, or the extracellular fluid pools into these tubes, and then the tubes have these lymph nodes, which are really treatment plants that are loaded with cells. And so the fluid comes in, 
these B and T cells look at the fluid and see if there's anything there that's not supposed to be there. And if there's everything's okay, it lets the fluid go through. If there's something that's not okay, then you're going to see uh, this thing where you get this uh, rapid expansion of cells. And again, we're going to talk about more about this in immunity, but it kind of plays a role here too because you start to get a swelling of the lymph node. And that's why sometimes you'll feel it when you're sick, you'll get these very enlarged glands. And I think the next slide shows that because you get this signal saying we got something wrong here in the fluid and we need to take care of it. And that's the expansion of the DNT cells that you see there. So again, just to kind of uh, kind of go around, uh, just briefly summarize, this is another set. So this lymphatic system is a set of tubes that drains fluid back to the heart. And so you get it back in and it connects right around the thymus area. That is also part of the immune system, but it connects right into the superior vena cava, right, right where it kind of connects into um, from the carotid uh, veins. And that's not carotid, but, um, you know, in those areas and that stuff and looking in and pulling, I think it's a, the, not the pulmonary, I, I don't remember. It's basically the superior vena cava and that stuff where it connects into and then it gets back into the heart and bringing the flow back. And so again, very similar to veins, they do have uh, uh, valves that prevent the backflow and that stuff. And so again, you can kind of see they're like the drainage tubes of the circulatory system. And so we'll look at that. Okay, like I said, the lymph nodes are packed of B and T cells. And so right here is a swollen lymph node. This is because you're getting expansion of this. And so again, it's basically an immune response. So if fluid comes in and it says, that's something not right there. It looks like you have some kind of infection going on. See virus particles or bacteria protein particles, and then the B and T cells respond. And so in, 30, in chapter 35, we're gonna learn about clonal expansion. There's a B and T cell there that see that, recognize and say, oh, bind on, grab onto it, and then they start to expand rapidly. And what you're seeing here in the swollen lymph node, this is essentially uh, enlargement of the numbers of B and T cells responding to an inside infection. So a lot of times you'll feel that when uh, you get sick because it's your B and T cells responding. Other times you'll feel that is when you get a vaccine because that stuff is pooling into the lymph nodes and then the lymph nodes recognize the vaccine uh, chemicals or pieces of viruses or bacteria and say that's not supposed to be there and then causes that expansion of the B and T cells, which are eventually will protect you. And again, we'll talk more about that in 35, but this just kind of shows you uh, what's going on in these situations. Now, again, the blood components function, exchange, transport, and defense. And so we'll talk about these things here. This is one of the last things we'll talk about. Again, the fluid in an open circulatory system is called hemolymph. And again, really doesn't have uh, a blood consistency to it. There are cells that can carry heme and that stuff to carry oxygen, but it's not the same as blood. In a closed circulatory system, you have blood, which can be more, uh, much more highly specialized. And again, this just gives you an example of some of the different types of, of uh, chemicals in there and the different colors of blood that you see. So some are red, some are blue, some are green, and some are purple based on the chemicals they have carrying the oxygen around. And so we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Oops, let me go back. Okay, so again, blood is a connective tissue. It's the liquid connective tissue. Again, it's consisting of cells suspended in a liquid matrix, uh, matrix called plasma. And again, plasma is about 55%. You can see most of it's water, but then a lot of these other things are gonna be um, ions, there are going to be proteins, there's going to be coagulation proteins, nutrients, vitamins, waste products, and a number of other things in the blood. The rest of it is the cells. And so again, most of it is red blood cells, which is by far probably the most. Then about 2% is the uh, white blood cells, and they're kind of right in the middle. We call this the buffy coat, and that's where the white blood cells sit. And then you have this other layer underneath the, the white blood cells, which are called the platelets. And these are really not even cells. They're more like uh, elements. And so a lot of times they call it cellular elements. And so these elements are really almost pieces of cells. They're not necessarily regular cells. They do activate and they respond and they are working for blood clotting. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a few minutes. Okay, so again, the plasma, like I said, plasma is about 55%. You have the white blood cells and the platelets, which are about 1%, and then the rest is the red blood cells, which are about 45%. Again, there's buffers, osmotic balance in the blood, plasma uh, proteins influence pH, osmotic pressure, and viscosity. And again, also for transport, immunity, and blood clotting. So plasma is a really important part. 
The yellow to the plasma is due to the dissolved proteins and sugars and, and nutrients that are in there, and so that's why it gives a yellow color. Lymph is a little bit uh, similar to that because that's what leaks into the extracellular fluid, but it's a little more green due to the salts and other things that are in there, and so the difference between plasma and lymph is where it's located because plasma is inside the blood vessel. Lymph is outside and in the lymphatic system, and it, again, the color is a little bit different. Plasma is a little more yellow where the lymph uh, is a little more green based on the different chemicals that are in there and some of the dissolved markers in that. Now again, blood contains two types of cells. You have the erythrocytes, which again transport O2, and the white blood cells are for defense. You have the platelets, which are third cellular elements. These are fragments of cells involved in clotting. And then again, you do have the stem cells, which are typically located in the red blood marrow. So you don't have floating stem cells typically. But again, typically in our bones of the red uh, marrow, that's where you're going to see cellular generation. And again, the stem cells give rise to all the blood cells. And so you have these lymphoid progenitors, which make lymphat lymphatic cell, or not lymphatic, but the lymphocytes, which are the B and T cells, which typically sit in the lymph nodes. You do have some free-flowing ones as well. Uh, and then you have the myeloid progenitors, which make up all the other ones, including the erythrocytes, the neutrophils, basophils, uh, monocytes, and eosinophils, along with the platelets, which come from megakaryocytes. And so, again, that's, that's some of the cells that are out there. And, again, blood clotting, most of these are defense, and then the erythrocytes are for carrying oxygen. Now, again, the erythrocytes are the red blood cells. They contain hemoglobin. And so hemoglobin is a four subunit protein. So again, kind of going back to the idea of our protein structure and that this is a quaternary uh, protein structure where you have multiple subunits. And each subunit has a heme molecule which will bind oxygen. So each molecule of hemoglobin can carry four oxygen molecules. And so it kind of gives why it gives the red blood cell its shape. So red blood cell is a donut shape and we'll talk about that here. So you can see you have two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. Each one, each subunit carries uh, oxygen. You can kind of see there's an opening in the middle and so that kind of gives the donut shape. Now in people that have sickle cell disease they have abnormal hemoglobin and really it's due to two uh, molecules and that is the valine and so you can kind of see how this flips and so you have the two uh, alpha and two beta on the top. In this case, you kind of get them to the sides, and so they don't line up correctly. They still carry blood, or they still carry oxygen because they do have those iron groups. But the problem is, is now you don't get this nice plump red cell. You get what is called this uh, sickle cell, and you can kind of see it changes the shape of the red blood cell. And these things can get wedged into uh, capillaries. And so this is the problem with these sickle cells is because of the sharp corners and the kind of the sickle shape, they can cause a really uh, big problem with this in essentially that they cause this, um, the, blood, or the blood cells to get caught and trapped. And so a lot of times you hear about people that have sickle cell anemia uh, one, they go into crisis, and the crisis is painful essentially because you're getting blood clots around in capillary beds and that stuff because, again, these things scrape against the, uh, the endothelium, and then you also have clotting a lot of times, especially in the capillary beds, and so that can be a, that can be a major issue where you get lots of blood clots. You're more at risk for heart attacks and strokes and other things, and so, and it's all due to the sickle hemoglobin due to the irregular shape. Again, you have the subunits, but now it forms a different structure than the nice plump normal hemoglobin that you see here. Now, erythrocytes can circulate for about 120 days, so that's their one job in life. And again, there's a feedback mechanism sensitive to O2 levels and blood controls. And so one of the things that can stimulate blood growth is uh, hypoxemia, which is essentially inadequate O2. And so people living at higher altitudes than that are exposed to this all the time. So if you go out to Denver and say you have a vacation out there, the first couple of days people can get really sick and that's called altitude sickness because again they're not getting enough oxygen to their to their cells because they're deprived of oxygen. So one of the things that uh, happens is that your body will respond to this and it's sensed by the liver and kidneys. They'll cause this erythral protein to be secreted and cause a stimulation of red, red, uh, red bone marrow. And so you get accelerated erythropoiesis, meaning you're getting more red blood cells. You increase the red blood cell count and now you increase the O2 transport. So now you feel better. And so you feel better by the end of the trip, but that's one of the reasons why they tell you to take drink a lot of water and that stuff when you're out there. So to limit headaches, 
headaches and that because you can get dehydrated faster too due to the lack of oxygen and that stuff. But one of the things is, is once you leave Denver and you go to sea level, now you have a lot more O2 and you come back and you feel like, wow, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to, you know, I could run through a wall. I could run through a race. I feel great. You know, you feel great for the next couple of days. So you kind of have this artificial high due to the increased level of O2 in your blood due to the blood cells. So there is a reason why we have all our Olympic training in, in the mountains because, again, a lot of that is due to, again, get athletes to get more blood, blood cells develop. Again, it's a natural way to kind of develop this so you get more oxygen in the muscles and so you can run a better race. And so that's why you see these Kenyans and that stuff in the African countries where they have high elevations always winning the marathons because they naturally have more blood cells so they can just keep going on and on and on because cell respiration can keep happening no problem. Whereas someone who's training at sea level will have a hard time keeping up because they're just at a disadvantage. And so the other place you see this is with blood doping. So you may have seen this with, again, the motorcycle, or not motorcycle, the bicycle race and that stuff and Lance Armstrong and that stuff. And so what they do is that they train at higher levels, they get blood cells, and then they pool their blood. So what they do is do blood transfusions. And so be a night before the race, they pump their blood full of more O2. And so, you know, not more O2, but essentially more blood cells so they could carry more too, so they could do better at the higher stages of the mountain. And so obviously that's illegal and you get busted for that and that's called blood doping. And so that's what they tend to do. So training at a higher level or training with lower oxygen is perfectly fine. There's nothing against that rule. And so you develop your muscles. And so that's why a lot of the Olympic training sites are equipped with either at higher altitudes or if you go to like the Pettit Center where they train for you know, the Winter Olympics uh, in, in ice skating, speed skating, a lot of times they'll have people stay in the hyperbaric rooms, which actually lower the oxygen content in the rooms while they're sleeping. So it kind of stimulates the production of red blood cells so that when they get to the race, they're ready to go and they have more O2. So again, that's just a little bit of something, again, kind of telling you know, going about uh, training and racing. And so as you train more, the better your body becomes more efficient to those types of things. Now, the leukocytes, again, there's five major types of white blood, white blood cells. These are called the leukocytes. Again, you have what are called granulocytes because they look granular on the inside, and then you have the agranulocytes. Now, three of these guys release granules, and they release granules to stimulate the immune system to cause that to respond. And so the most common one is the neutrophil. This goes after bacterial infections. Again, we'll talk about this in Chapter 35. You have the eosinophils, which are typically set there for... Um, these are there for eukaryotic parasites. And then you have the good old basophils. Now, basophils are the ones that are kind of the mean guys because typically they're there as an immune responder, but they're also a negative connotation is the ones that trigger the allergies. And so they become the mast cells and then they spew their granules, releasing histamine, which causes you to have an immune response and uh, could be bad enough for anaphylaxis. And again, we'll talk about this in chapter 35. The other two types of cells, you have the lymphocyte, which is the B and T cells. And then you have the macrophages or the monocytes, and they're called monocytes when they're in the blood system. And then when they leave, they're called macrophages. And they kind of have the same role as neutrophils. They eat and digest bacteria, but they also have an important role connecting to the uh, third line of defense where they present what they eat. So they're kind of like a little kid and say, hey, mom, look what I ate. we got to do something about this. And so they, explain, they basically present that to the T and B cells and say, we need to do something. Let's do it. And so they do and get rid of it. So again, that's how it works. Now, the last thing is the platelet. And again, these are fragments of cells. They come from megakaryous sites and they're just pieces of cell. They're used kind of like putty. So when you have a hole in the wall or something like that, you put putty in it to cover it up and then you paint over it. This is kind of the same thing. What these guys are used for is kind of like putty that allows them to stick. And you can see they're not really the same size of the cell. They're much smaller. And again, they're used, they get activated, and then they stick to things. And one of them is to prevent you from bleeding to death. And so we'll look at that. So again, coagulation is the formation of solid clot. There's a cascade of complex reactions. And so it's not just as easy as these platelets get activated. But one thing is the platelet does activate. It starts to fill the hole and then your blood will coagulate. And so there is a enzymatic cascade with a number of blood factors. We're not gonna get in that today and that stuff. And you form this clot to prevent you from bleeding to death. And so that's the idea. And so you can see here, red blood cells being caught in the threads of uh, 
fibrin, and again, that's part of the blood clot. And so this is good when you're bleeding, but bad when you have other things uh, like a heart attack or stroke, and we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. And so again, when the blood vessel, uh, blood clot in the uh, blood vessel is called a thrombus, and again, this thing can move, if it breaks free, can go into the um, lungs, the, the heart, or the brain and cause some serious problems. But We'll think of it as a good thing right now to keep you from bleeding to death, but it can have some negative connotations as well. Now, the last thing, and I promise I'm done, we'll talk quickly about cardiovascular disease. And again, these are disorders of the heart and blood vessels. And again, cardiovascular disease is probably, besides cancer, the leading cause of death in the United States each year. And really, it's a lot of it's due to the high fat diets that we eat. And again, what happens is fat builds up in the arteries called plaque, and they preclude the artery and cause cause essentially clots that occur, especially on the heart muscle, the lungs, and also in the brain as well. And so that's the problem. So normally arteries are supposed to be nice and clean, moving blood through, but in this situation, you have the blocked artery, which can cause platelets to clog up, and then you get a clot, which forms in these situations. Now, again, damage or infection can roughen the endothelium and lead to arthrosclerosis. So sometimes you can see that an infection like vasculitis can actually roughen up the endothelium. And really what triggers a thrombus a lot of times is the exposure of the smooth muscle under the endothelium. So if it gets roughed up a nut, it can trigger the blood vessel or the, the platelets to start to activate and stick together. And that's a bad thing. So whenever you have a tear in your vessel or you have exposure of the smooth muscle, that will activate the platelets and say, ooh, we got to do something. We got to clog the hole. And so they'll clot. And so that will happen. And that's what happens a lot of times is you have these fatty deposits and they actually roughen the, the vessel. And so it causes these things to stick and cause a clot. And so you can see here, here's a plaque from fatty deposits in the vessel itself. And it's causing, again, a, a closure or occlusion to happen in the vessel. Now, what triggers this a lot of times is the cholesterol that we have, and we have two types. We have the low-density lipoprotein, or the LDL, which is the cholesterol that uh, is used for membrane production, and then you have the high-density lipoprotein, or HDL, which scavenge, scavenges the liver. Now, again, the risk for heart disease goes up when you have high LDL to low HDL, so you wanna really up this, and so this is why people take things like fish oil and plant oils and that stuff to get the good HDL up because what it does is it actually excretes the LDL out of the system and so that's why you want to have these good fats in you and so you're looking for sources of good fats nuts uh, fish oils and other things like that that are good for you the LDL is what causes them to stick and so you can see the LDL is accumulating in the vessels it roughen, roughens up the vessels as well as accumulates and causes the deposits where now you've shrunk the vessel itself and that can lead to coagulation and then again um, again the blocking of the vessels and so again this is, and then inflammation also plays a role because that can thicken the the um, walls and like I said it can expose the smooth muscle under the endothelium due to inflammation and trigger a uh, platelets to start responding as well now a heart attack or a myocardial infunction is the death of the cardiac muscle and that's essentially when you have a blockage in the artery or the coronary one or more coronary arteries and it blocks the flow and so that's an issue that can happen there a stroke is essentially when you have uh, blood flow that blocks the um, brain, the arteries to the brain, and again, you get death in the brain. Uh, and again, it's due to the lack of oxygen that gets there. Now, some people will have this issue where they have what is called angina, which is temporary chest pain or pressure discomfort in the chest. And that is due to, again, arteries that are not blocked, but they're partially blocked. And sometimes it can cause chest pain because of the pressure and other things. And so they don't have a full complete blockage and it may not be worth doing you know the the typical surgeries that you see so they may take um, drugs like nitroglycerin and other things when they get that chest pain to open up the vessels and so they cause the vasodilation to occur so it's not bad enough that they need to go in for a bypass or anything else but they may have enough of a blockage that causes pain in the heart and that due to the narrowing of the arteries in these situations Okay, so again, the high LDL to HDL is the ratio that increases the risk for this. Again, you can see some of the other risk factors, diabetes, which affects circulation. Again, the sugar in the blood, 
overweight, and again, that kind of goes with diabetes, high cholesterol, which is starting to block the arteries, uh, high blood pressure. So again, the pressure against the vessels causes more likely to trigger some of these things. Smoking, which we know because it decreases the exchange and gases as well as some of the um, the uh, toxins in the in the cigarettes and that stuff. And then again, family history plays a huge role. And so if you if you have family history of uh, core, er, cardiac events, then it's probably more likely that you yourself could have this as well. And so again, and some of this can be genetic just in the amount of cholesterol too. And that has a um, or where you have hypercholesterolemia, where essentially you have this hyper level of LDL in your body, even though you may eat perfectly and eat great foods, you still have this due to a genetic defect. And so um, you produce too much LDL, and now you're on drugs the rest of your life to kind of lower that down so you don't have a heart attack or stroke because of the high levels of cholesterol that you have. And so again, one of the drugs that are out there is the statins, which reduce the LDL levels of heart attacks and that stuff, and that's another reason why you take it. Now, other things that uh, play a role can uh, inflammation. Again, inflammation in there is always an issue because, again, when you have inflammation, you can get damage of the vessels, and damage to the vessels can trigger platelets to activate. One way to combat that is taking aspirin. So if you've had a heart attack or stroke, they do recommend a low dose of aspirin uh, in that stuff. But one thing aspirin does is delays the um, the activation of the platelets. And so you tend to bleed more. So again, taking too much aspirin is not a good thing because now you will delay the response. And so you can get internal bleeding. So someone who takes a lot of aspirin in their life can a lot of times get bleeding in the stomach or in the gut because of that. Um, and also have other effects where they bruise easier and that stuff as well. So that's not the cure all end all that we should all just be taking aspirin to do that. Another uh, issue is hypertension, high blood pressure, because it contributes to the risk. Again, higher pr blood pressure can cause damage to the vessels and that along with uh, enlargement of the heart because you got to pump more in that. And then again, hypertension can be reduced by dietary changes, exercise, medication, and some combination of these. Now, one of the things that wasn't talked about is if you do have a blockage, a lot of times what they can do is do this thing called angioplasty and stents. And so essentially what angioplasty is, is where they take a balloon and they inflate it and push this out. And then what they'll do is along with that is have this metal stent, which kind of goes in and it pushes the artery open. And so it opens that up. And so some people, um, if they have block arteries or had a heart attack, what they'll do is they'll take a long catheter going from the groin and they work all the way up through the vena cava into the heart and into the arteries and that, and then they'll go in, actually, I think they go through the artery because again, they'll go into the arteries, the coronary arteries and open those up through the heart. Okay. And then they'll do the balloon angioplasty and open that up. Now, uh, in the severe cases where you have very large occlusions, like uh, 90 to 100 percent, they may recommend bypass. And so what they do is they bypass the graft. So what they'll do is they'll connect it from the aorta. So you can see here, the aorta right here, they'll connect the vessel. So they'll take a vein from the leg and then connect that from the aorta to the coronary artery below the level so the blood flow can get in. So that's when you're really blocked up and angioplasty is not gonna work. But typically, if you catch a heart attack in time and get to the hospital in time, so if you feel those pains, and again, in men and women, it's a little bit different, uh, some of the symptoms that you have, and a lot of times it goes underdiagnosed in women, and, and that's because of the symptoms that they have. But if you do feel like anything, call 911. Do not drive yourself to the hospital. Uh, and again, it's all about the timing. The faster you are, the more likely you're going to get a, a treatment to resolve the problem. And so they either can do angioplasty or get you in so they can do bypass uh, right away and that stuff. So again, you don't want to mess around with these things because heart muscle death, you know, that doesn't come back. It doesn't regenerate. And so it can be, the, uh, be a matter of life and death, especially uh, when you hear about these situations. So that's one of the problems. Other things, same thing with stroke. And that, the amount of time. So if you do feel dizzy or, you know, you start having the droopiness on one side or something else with the neurological, don't don't think it's going to get better. Just go to the hospital. And again, time, time saves. And so that's the biggest thing, the biggest message I can give uh, for you guys today. Okay, so.
with that, we made it to the end. Hopefully you stayed on, made it through. I know this is a really long video. Just think if I would put respiration with it, but a lot of side stories and that stuff, but I think they're important to talk about. So again, the circulatory systems link exchange surfaces with cells throughout the body. So that's a big thing. Coordinated cycles of the heart contraction drive double circulation in the mammals. So again, when you beat, you're not only pumping blood to the lungs, but you're also pumping blood to the rest of the body. And again, we saw the variance in the vertebrae you start with the two-chambered heart, the three, and then finally the most efficient, the four-chambered heart going through the double circulation. And so in fish, they don't have uh, double circulation. They only have single circulation. And again, pumping it one th way through. And then as you get bigger and bigger animals, more complex, you're gonna see the double double circulatory system now with three, then four going through and doing all those different things. Again, patterns of blood pressure and flow reflect the structure and arrangement of the blood vessels, higher blood pressure in the arteries, lower blood pressure in the veins. That's why arteries have to be thicker, again, so they don't blow out and that stuff, as well as using the muscular contractions to get the blood to, to the capillaries where they can do exchange. Capillaries are by far going to be the thinnest of all the blood vessels because they got to do the exchange of oxygen and nutrients from inside to outside the vessel. And then we talked about the blood components again, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and then the platelets and what they do. And again, exchange, transport, and defense and all the stuff that they do there. Okay, and with that, we made it to the end of the video. If you do have any questions about the circulatory system, I could go on for days about some of the stuff. It's probably because I worked at the blood center for so long, so I picked up a lot of these things as well along the way and that stuff. But if you do have questions, let me know. Uh, I'll be glad to help you ask you know, some of the questions you might have and that stuff. So um, glad to help out. So with that, I'll leave you there. I'll see you next time, and thanks for watching.